Hey everyone, welcome back. And I am pleased to welcome John Rose, Global Chief Technology Officer at Dell Technologies. Welcome, John. Great to be here. Like, I'm so excited to have you here. You get to work on future technology across the entire company, you know? So can you explain how generative AI is transforming the way organizations approach data an uh, analysis as well as decision making? Yeah, well, well first, uh, you know, if you, I don't know, been living in a cave, you might have missed the generative AI discussion. <laughs> uh, you know, suddenly <laughs> there's this technology that most yeah. people think is new, but it, it really isn't. I mean, AI's yes. been on a, a, a long evolution. But what's happened recently is the, the technology capability of what we'll call generative AI, which are AIs that produce co original content, mm -hmm. has gotten much better. Uh, yeah. And whether that was through GPT-3 or BARD or different things yeah. going in the public domains, uh, regardless, what's occurred is those technologies have improved. Now, what are those technologies? What do they bring to us? Well, they don't actually bring to us human thought. They're not going to replace your brain. Mm -hmm. What they do is a very specific task at a technical level. They are extremely good at predicting the next word in a sentence to answer a question based yeah. on the data they've been trained on. And they're so good that you really can't distinguish them from a human being. And the result of that is we now have not a new way to think, but a new way to interact with thinking machines. And yeah. so generative AI has, for the first time, changed the relationship between human and people so that you no longer need to be an expert yeah. to actually make these systems do things for you. They are the new user interface. And so when you take that and apply it to you know, data analysis, yep. decision making, anything that goes on in an enterprise, well, think about it in the past. The team that you would ask to do data analysis was a very specialized team that knew the crazy languages of how to talk to computers yes. and databases. Uh -huh. In a generative AI environment, you, the CEO of the company, can ask a question and get an answer. Anyone mm -hmm. can interact with these systems because they're speaking human. They understand how to work on our terms. And so the result of that is that we have democratized access to that data. We have given it, the, 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 the entire population of the world, the ability yeah. to have a first order relationship with its underlying machine intelligences that people have been using for quite some time to solve other problems, but now they're available to everybody. And, yeah. and the result of that is if you apply that to decision making, again, you take a whole bunch of steps out of the process. Think about this. If you decide, okay, I want to target a, a, the best customers for Dell. Well, in the old world, you know, the leader of Dell sales might make that statement, and then he would task somebody to translate that into a technical project, yes. and then there would be this big, long technical project of which people who understood computer language would try to translate what that meant, and then maybe at the end of it, after months and months <laughs> and months of work, there would be an answer that would say, okay, we're going to give you a report, you know, a dashboard that would tell you which customers to go after, and that extended right. process was not a function of what the data was telling you. It was always telling you the right answer. Right. It was the ability to actually interact with that data. data. So now, yeah. that type of decision making about, well, if I have the data, can I figure out which customers to go after is now a conversation with a computer. It's no right. longer a giant, complex IT project. Now, let's not make it too simple. To actually build the infrastructure mm -hmm. to make that conversation happen is what enterprises are doing today. They are yeah. figuring out that you don't get this for free. If you want a generative AI system to be able to make smart decisions and interact with your yeah. sales force based on what Dell understands, well, you have to build that model. You have to train that mm -hmm. model. You have to maintain that model. But once you do, the net benefit is there are no longer a army of middlemen translating human to technology yes, to accomplish these tasks. That. You close the gap. Yeah. You've democratized it. You make it accessible directly to your yeah. entire population. And the net benefit of that is speed. You can get access to your data a faster, faster than yes. somebody else. And so that's why this is so important. It's, it's not a revolution on the data. It's not even a revolution on how we think about the data. It's a revolution on how we access the tools that allow us to unlock yes. the power of that data on a human level, which you know is a fantastic disruption, as right. we can see. And which leads me to my next question. So. You know, how is Dell Technologies leveraging this generative AI in our products and services? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been working in generative AI for a very long time, probably since it, the domain existed. We have, you know, many, many years of work in the AI space with our customers and internally. Any given year, we might have a thousand projects going on. But, but generative AI is interesting because based on what I just said, yeah. you know, it gives you a new way to express content to a broader population directly. And so we're, we're creating digital humans, which are new ways for you to interact with our service organization. We're looking at ways to put new front ends on top of everything. You know, some, some 
some people call them chatbots, but imagine if your interaction with your sales data was a chatbot or your interaction with the HR systems was a chatbot that yeah. really understood contextually how to talk to you how and to interact to with you. Yeah you can transform almost any process in the company. And so, you know, we have always had a pillar called AI4, which is to use AI within Dell to improve the productivity and effectiveness of all of our business processes. Yeah. This becomes the newest tool in that arsenal that's yes. going to accelerate that. Yeah, and so what are some of the key challenges and limitations of this generative AI technology yeah. today, and how can they be addressed? Well, there are, there are tons. Uh, it's a fantastic technology that candidly very few people in the world understand, understand. at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can, see, because you've experienced it, you know that ChatGPT is pretty cool. You yeah. ask it something, it gives you a real human sounding language back and, and therefore you've acknowledged its value without even fully understanding Standing it. it. Mm -hmm. And so in order to bring it into an enterprise context, we have to understand it better. We have to develop the skill sets to, I don't know, let's give you a bunch of questions you have to answer. Well, which model should I use to accomplish the task of a digital human for customer service? Um, what is the best infrastructure to run it on? Today we oversimplify it and think it's always a giant cloud infrastructure. In fact, most of the generative AI in the world will not run on giant cloud infrastructures because they're yeah. domain or process specific tasks. You will then have to answer questions around, well, do I have the rights to this data? Are there any particular regulatory issues I have to face? And yeah. so. We are predicting that while generative AI is a fantastic technology, inevitably will be very disruptive, yes. the biggest area of work isn't the generative AI itself, no. it's the enterprise adaptation of it. And you know, we're kind of good at enterprise adaptation of stuff. We understand it, we've done it ourselves, and that's the market we live in. So a lot of the problems are not about the generative AI system yes. itself, it's about the context of using it in the real world. Right, and so I mean, I know that we've been dealing with generative AI for a really long time. And like you said, we're really good at implementing those things. But what advice would you have for businesses and leaders who are just now beginning to like explore the potential? Well, the first thing I would tell you, and I, I use this statement on every big technology inflection. I used it around cloud native software development, around modern data management, streaming data is get involved, do, do your next project. Don't find a reason and a way to actually exercise some of these projects to completion, to implement mm -hmm. a generative AI system. And let me give you a, a, a fast path. Today we're obsessed about using generative AI in enterprises or paranoid about it because we're concerned we may give away some private information. We may mm -hmm. give up some data that we don't want people to use. Well, let me give you a piece of advice. If you want to move fast, pick some data that you don't care about, that you want people to see, like your marketing data or your manuals or your things that are already public. Mm -hmm. There's no regulatory or compliance obligation. That yeah. data set exists, it's your data, and you can very quickly apply it. And by the way, your lawyers probably won't be super upset about it and you can move <laughs> fast. Because right now it's not about getting to some abstract end state, it's yes. about getting on the train and starting to exercise it. So find your first project, find one that doesn't have a lot of obstacles around it, and start to get comfortable with all those decisions. Which model, what infrastructure, how do I make it work, what problem am I solving? Don't sit on the sidelines. This is too big to do that. Yeah, and with it being too big, it's been around for a while, and to your point, it's just accelerating a lot faster. Exactly. And so what role do you see generative AI playing in the shaping of the future of work and the industry. Yeah, well, in AI in general, or, or well, let's go back even further, the relationship between people and machines is dynamic. Yes. You know, the Industrial Revolution suddenly took all the mechanical work and made machines do it. That was pretty cool. We, most of us are not out harvesting our wheat by hand and doing things like that. We, you know, we have machines to do that. And we've got pretty good at that. But until recently, all of the intellectual work, decision-making, thinking, was largely a human task, and machines augmented a little bit, but really didn't do it. The AI revolution we're in right now is all about redefining that line between what thinking tasks get done by a machine and what thinking tasks be do are done by a human being. And you know, here's, here's a reality. It is inevitable that more of those tasks will shift into the machines. It's just more efficient and more effective. So right now, as you think about the future of work and the future of industry, you have to start asking the question of what are the things that actually you don't want to do anymore, that they make more sense to push into an AI and let a machine yep. do, and then what will you do on top of that? So I imagine if you didn't have to do all the rote work, you could develop the new architectures, you could think through the next big problem. We have an immense backlog of work to be done right now because we're spending a lot of time on kind of rinse and replace stuff that the machine ought to be doing. And so my advice is looking ahead, contemplate your world, your industry, your work environment, and understand that you have an opportunity to move some of the tasks into the machine layer that maybe you couldn't do before the AI task. What are they? 
what happens when you do that and how does your life improve? Look, I really, and I could talk to you about this all day. It is so interesting to me. So, John, thank you so, so much for joining us.